from San Antonio, Texas, USA. We welcome you to Sunday Church Service at Journey to the Cross Church with Senior Pastor George Barrera, Jr. and his wife, Rose Barrera. Thank you for gathering with us to worship our Lord and give thanks. You know that the Bible says that He's the one that will never leave you nor forsake you. Your friends and your family can leave you right now, but God will never leave you. Holy 
we surrender to you, Father God. We lift up our voices, Lord. We lift up our spirit, Father God. You're worthy of all glory, all honor, and all praise, Lord. I'm here, Lord Jesus. I'm here, Father God. I'm here to worship you. I don't care who else is in this room. Amen. Come on. Come on. Amen. This song is for you, Lord. Hallelujah. This voice is for you. Hallelujah. I'm for the Lord. about you and him. It doesn't matter who's here with us. It don't matter what happened before you got here. It don't matter where you're going after this. Right now, this moment, we surrender to him. Amen.
Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are in economic strife right now, we need you, Lord. Lord, we need you. Lord, on my heart, you're laying marriages, Father God. I pray for every marriage that is here right now, Father God. I pray for husband and wife. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, just like you told us in your word in the book of Revelation, not to lose our first love, Lord, I pray for husband and wife to not lose that first love, Lord God. I pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit down on them, Father God, that they would recognize that they, husband and wife, are the church, that they are a church in their home, that they are a ministry, Father God. Lord, I bless every marriage that is at the sound of my voice, Lord. Lord, may we set the silly things aside, Lord. May we set the silly things aside. Today we are grateful, Lord God. Husbands, we are grateful for our wives. Wives, we are grateful for your husbands. Lord, thank you. Thank you. For those who are single, Father God, I pray for the blessing of marriage. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we come to know that amazing blessing, Lord God. I pray, Heavenly Father, for every need, even that secret need. Yes. Even that need where we don't want to share it, Lord God, but you know. You know today, Lord. Bless this congregation, Lord God. Bless this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome, Brother George. Amen. God bless you. I'm ready to jump right in. I hope y'all are ready as well. Amen. Amen. You know, this song that we were singing a minute ago, it, it talks about surrendering. It's one of my favorite songs in the whole world. Because it, it really ministers to the heart about surrendering your will to God's will and letting Him have His way in your life. And that's what today's message is about. It's about repenting and it's about changing direction. There are some of us that have known the Lord for years and we've been in and out of seasons in our life and God has a plan for each and every one of us. But there are times where we have to regroup and we have to we have to refresh and we have to revive even, even computer systems. You have to every once in a while click a refresh button, kind of get back to the basics, get back to the fundamentals like like Pastor was saying a minute ago. To not lose your first love in the Lord and not become religious and just going through the motions and going through the routine routines and going just just walking this walk out because this is what we're supposed to do, but rather to fall in love with Jesus all over again. You know, the Bible says that his mercies are renewed every morning. And if that's the case, then maybe we should renew our commitments every morning. We're going to jump into that. Today, the title of today's message is does he have your attention? Does he have your attention? It's talking about the Lord. If you have your Bibles, if you would open them up with me, please, to Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 7 in the New King, King James Version. And it, it reads like this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It says... Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of, of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning, but the bush was not consumed. So then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. In other words, I'm going to go check this out, is what he's saying. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. 
the place of bondage and slavery, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Right there where you're at, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, and I thank you for the opportunity, the privilege, and the honor to be able to speak and preach and teach this word. Now, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would anoint every single word that's about to leave my lips and follow that it would pierce the hearts of men and women in this place and those who are watching online somewhere. Father, in the name of Jesus, whether they see it today or whether they see it on another day, I pray that it would divinely impact people's lives. The Bible says that the grass may wither and the flower may fade, but that your word remains forever. So I pray in the name of Jesus that your word would reign, remain forever in our hearts and that you, 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 the mighty King of kings and the Lord of lords would reign in our hearts forever and ever and that we would never lose sight and that we would never lose focus of who you are and what you've done and what you're capable of. I pray that in Jesus' name. Break every chain and set every captive free in the house of God this morning in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all ready? All right. All right. So over the years and over, over throughout time and over throughout history, one thing that I've learned, whether it's by reading it or hearing it from older people, I've learned that at different times in history, at different times in Scripture, the church would fill to capacity and beyond. And usually it was after some type of tragic event or some type of near scare. I've learned and I've read and I've heard that churches filled up after Israel became a nation once again in 1948 because it was a fulfillment of prophecy that God would bring them back as a nation. I heard it and I read it and it happened again in 1968 when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. It happened again when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Perhaps people thought that it, this was the time that Jesus was going to come back. But after a while, when he didn't come back, people went back to their old way of life. They went back to life as usual, and they left the church once again. The same thing happened after, right after 9-11. Churches were packed. People were afraid that something may happen. And so they filled the churches. For at least a year, churches were packed after 9-11. Some of you may remember that. And then after a while, when Jesus didn't come back, they left the church again. And I've learned that whenever something bad happens, people will think things and they'll say things like, Lord, if you get me out of this, if you get us out of this, I'll never do it again. Lord, if you will save me, I'll serve you. If you will do this for me, then I'll serve you for the rest of my life. If you will rescue me, then I will seek you more and I'll seek you with all of my heart and all of my mind. And some people will only seek God when they're in trouble or when they need something from Him. And for the last two years, we have been in a pandemic like we've never seen before in our lives. No one in this room and no one watching online has ever seen what we saw for the last two years. And during this time, many churches closed down. And for the first time in history, people were saying, do we not live by faith? As a matter of fact, Therefore, while everywhere shut down, the whole world shut down, and now things are opening up again. Some of you are still working from home. What we've learned is that not everybody has to be in the office. They can actually watch you and guard your time from home, and you can actually work from home. There are some people who are still streaming online because they are afraid to come out. But whenever these atrocities and these tragedies happen, what we've learned is that all of a sudden, a new hunger for the things of God are birthed. All of a sudden, you start figuring out well, what's going to happen to us next, or you begin to research the scripture. It's actually amazing how so many different tragedies and atrocities can create a new hunger for the things of God. People will naturally draw closer to God whenever their mortality is in question, or whenever they think that they could possibly die. And all of a sudden, we start to look at things differently than what we used to. And I believe that God allows certain things to happen in our lives for a reason. And if you and I don't get the reason why he allowed it, then we are doomed to repeat that thing over again. We're doomed to repeat that part of history over again until we finally capture it. If you don't believe me, read your Bible and you'll realize in the book of Exodus that God took this people around a mountain for 40 years in circles because they were stiff-necked 
And because they were stubborn and because they could not capture what God was trying to show them. They could not learn what God was trying to teach them. There's always a reason why God takes you through the things that he takes you through. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing happens by coincidence. Nothing happens by happenstance. And nothing that you go through will ever be wasted. God is not one to waste your time. God will make sure that he monopolizes on all the time that you go through. And I believe that even this global pandemic happened for a reason. I believe that even what is happening today in Ukraine is happening for a reason. I believe that God is trying to get our attention. I believe that God is trying to tell us something. And it could be that his coming is nearer than it's ever been before. And he's given us time for you and I to get ready. He's showing us the signs and talking about the rumors of wars and talking about wars so that you and I can get ready and so that nobody will be left behind. He doesn't want to leave anyone behind. There's a scripture in the Bible that says that he wants none of us to perish. So what does he do is he starts to show you all of these miracles, signs and wonders. He starts to show you that his word is real. And what do we do? We sit there and we say, ah, it's just by happenstance. It's just by coincidence. When in reality, God doesn't want you and I to perish and he's going to get us back in line so that way he can have his way and so that way he can save more through you and so that way he can empty out hell and fill up heaven in the name of Jesus. So it's time for you and I to pay attention because that's what he's trying to do. If there's anything that I've learned in the last two years is that God can stop everything in a moment to get your attention and he did and my question to you this morning is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to waste time away? Are you going to sit there and nag and complain and murmur and grumble and say, well, I don't know, if God is real, why would he allow us to go through this? Instead of doing that, why don't you do your part as a Christian? And say, you know what, Lord, you let this happen for a reason. Don't let another soul perish, Father God. Use me. Don't sit there and think it's someone else's job. Because God may be wanting to use you to save people. God may be wanting to use you to love on people with his love. There are people that you can reach that nobody else can reach. And it's time for you and I to start being the church again. You can't tell me that he wasn't trying to get our attention before it's too late. Does he have your attention this morning? Or have you blown it off? If you read your Bible, you'll see that all throughout Scripture and all throughout history, every time that a people became stubborn and every time that a people became stiff, that God would do whatever he had to do to get them to repent and to get them to turn their lives around. Whether they were church people or not, whether they were holy people or not, whether they were religious people or not, none of us are immune and none of us are exempt from getting right with Jesus this morning and getting right with the Lord and growing and moving and learning. You have to capture and you have to learn what you're supposed to or it'll get worse. Amen. You and I both have a part in this. And we have to learn and we have to capture what we're supposed to. Or it's going to get worse. We have to stop letting politics override our Christianity. Or it'll get worse. I don't care which way you vote. But don't let it consume <coughs> you to where, you're, where you are more of that party than you are a Christian. Because that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. Because both sides are lying to us. Amen? I may get canceled, but it's all good. Amen? Amen. We need to stop calling wrong, wrong things right, and we need to start, stop calling right wrong, or it's going to get worse. God is going to do whatever he has to do to get his people's attention. And he has a way of humbling us to our lowest common denominator. He has a way of stripping everything away until there is nothing left but for us to look up at him. Do you remember in, this middle, in the middle of this thing? When the whole world was shut down and all of a sudden, slowly, people started opening up and they started moving things and we were stopping what we were doing. And we were thanking truck drivers. And we were walking up to grocery people personnel and we were telling them, thank you, you're a hero. Do you remember that? H-E-B kept texting us going in the middle of this thing. And we were sitting there and we were thanking them and we were thanking nurses and we were calling them heroes and we were having parades for them and we were having drive-by parades for them and we were telling them that they were awesome and now we scoff at the idea of them getting a raise because we got through it and now we feel like, ah, oh, well, too bad. It stinks to be you. You know, my son works for h and he got COVID twice just for doing his job. And so many other people do that. People like my son are my heroes and so are all the people who do what he does. And now that things are slowing down and things are getting back to a sense of normal, and going back to this place where we were, people want to start being mean to each other once again. I was telling Brother Sean on the way over here about two weeks ago, I stopped in the middle of an aisle. I was driving, 
and I was going to park, and I stopped in the middle of an aisle to, I was messing with my son, he was, he was walking somebody to their car, it was an older person, he was walking them to the car, and I see him, and I tell my wife, hey look, there's Georgie, and I'm like on the next lane, so I cut in between the cars to go mess with him, and I get behind him, and I honk the horn at him, and I stop, and, I, and he's like, hey, how are you doing, and we start talking, and all of a sudden, right behind him, this guy starts wanting to fight with me. And I laughed about it. He started cursing me out, calling me every name in the book. And I said, uh, Amen. God bless you. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were in a hurry. And it almost went into a fight. But God was gracious to that dude because Georgie wouldn't let me off the car. God was looking out for that dude. He cussed out my son. And, and I'll tell you this, man. You talk to me however you want, but you don't talk to my family. Yeah, not while I'm alive, that's for sure. Yeah, right. And I share that with you, not to say, oh, I'm bad, nothing like that, but we're supposed to, as Christians, we're supposed to treat all people with dignity and respect. All people. doesn't matter their gender, it doesn't matter their ethnicity, it doesn't matter their, 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 their religious uh, uh, stance, their political stance, it doesn't matter their creed or their origin. None of that matters. We're supposed to treat all people with dignity and respect. And we need to turn some things around in our lives. And we need to turn from some of the things that we've been doing, or it's going to get worse. We have to repent and we have to change direction. Otherwise, we're doomed to repeat this process over and over again until you finally get it. If you don't believe me, just read your Bible. The word repentance, it means to change direction or to change behavior. That's what it actually means. So as things get back to a, a, a type of normal, you need to change your direction and you need to change your behavior to something different than it was before this pandemic. We're not supposed to go back to that. We're supposed to come out of this thing better. And many of us are saying, I can't wait till things get back to normal so that way I can do such and such. And in reality, maybe you're not supposed to be doing such and such. Maybe you're supposed to be doing a new thing. One thing that I've learned about reading my Bible is that God wants to do a new thing in all of us. In spite of where we're at in our relationship with him, in spite of our age, he wants to do a new thing. And during the last two years, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, we need to pray these things away. We need to pray COVID away. I've actually seen where churches will have specific church services or church meetings or prayer meetings to specifically pray this thing away. And there are some believers who sincerely want to do something about this thing, even till this day, because this thing is still going around. For a bunch of time, we, for a, a long time, we had to shut down the praise and worship because people, different people at different times were going through it. My sister Adrian, she just got back from it. That's why she's still coughing. From it. She's no longer positive. She's coughing antibodies onto everybody. So you're welcome. Wow. <laughs> but, but I share that with you. I hope I'm not violating the HIPAA law. But I'm sharing that with you because I want you to know that this, these are the things that are holding us back. And there are some people, Christian people, true Christian believers, who will tell you that it was prayers that stopped the plagues in the days of the Bible. What I started to realize as I started to research my word is that it wasn't just the prayers of the people that stopped the plagues. I'll submit to you this morning that it was also the people's repentance that stopped the plague. You see, we can all come together and we can all pray and we can all sing Kumbaya. I'm not being ugly or disrespectful. We can do all of the religious, religious rituals. We can do all the re religious rhetoric. But if we don't repent, then what is happening can still happen and it'll still continue to happen. In the book of Jonah, prayer didn't stop God from destroying Nineveh. It was repentance that stopped God from, from, from destroying Nineveh. It was when the people turned their hearts back to God that God stayed the plague. Repentance is real change and it is conviction that comes straight from the Holy Spirit. And there are times in your life, regardless of who you are, regardless of where you're at, regardless of who you think you are, where it's time to repent and it's time to change your ways and turn your heart back to the living God. If you look back at your life, you'll see that God allowed certain things to happen to get your attention. And some of us, out of pride or out of ignorance, we ignored it. Sometimes God will allow things to happen to make you shut your mouth. He'll make you eat your words. I promise you that. I've had to learn that the hard way many, many, many times in my life. To the point to where I know I choose my words carefully now when I'm going to say something dumb. I still say dumb things sometimes, but I try to choose my words Carefully. Sometimes God will allow things to happen to humble your heart and to humble you as a person. And
and to humble your pride, whether you're a believer or not. Don't think that you are that you are that you're that this that you're immune to this because you're a believer. Sometimes God will allow things to happen to bring you to your knees in prayer. Mm. Sometimes things will happen to remind you that you're not untouchable and you're not invincible and that you're not holier than thou. Sometimes things will happen in your life to let you know that you don't know everything like you thought you did. It's a humbling, it's a breaking that takes place. Sometimes God will do will allow things to happen in your life that don't make any sense. Sometimes things will happen in your life that will make you want to quit and give up. There are some times where you feel like, Lord, just take me now because I don't want to go through this anymore. Sometimes things will happen to make you seek God more for answers. And maybe that's why he lets some of these things happen. And I'm not just talking about COVID. It could be breast cancer. It could be... A divorce. It could be a death in the family. It could be a wayward child or a special needs child. It could be an estranged spouse. It could be something that you're going through in your life and God is trying to get your attention privately before you shame yourself and shame Him publicly. That's the truth. He'll give you many, many warning signs. God will use an accident to get your attention. Mm. He'll use the loss of a limb to get your attention. He'll use a funeral to get your attention. He'll use sickness, infirmity, and disease to get your attention. He'll use a pandemic to get your attention. He'll use a divorce and a separation to get your attention. He'll use an overdose to get your attention. He'll use war to get your attention. The Bible says that God told Moses take off for him to take the sandals off his feet for the place where he was standing was holy ground. I need you to understand this, and I need you to capture this. It was holy ground, not because of the ground was holy, but because God was there. Wherever God is, it becomes holy because God is there. If God shows up in your living room during a time of praise and worship, that place becomes holy because God Almighty is there. If He shows up in the shower while you're taking a shower and sing praises to Him, it, that place becomes holy because His presence is there. He can show up in your car, and if He shows up in your car, that place now becomes holy ground. Just because you walk into a church building doesn't make the church building holy. It's because the presence of God is in that place that makes it holy. So He can make your house holy. He can make your car holy. He can make your job holy. He can make your heart holy. He can make all of those things holy. He can make the hospital bed holy ground. The moment that He steps in, His holiness shows up and all devils and demons have to flee because they are cowards and they belong in hell. So the scripture goes on to say that he said, I am the father, I am the, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I love that he says this. I want you to notice this, that he didn't say, you got to remember who Jacob was. Jacob was the one who wrestled with God. And the Bible says that the night that he wrestled with God, that God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Because he had contended with God and he had overcome. So, God had already, by this point right here that we're reading, God had already changed Jacob's name to Israel, and Israel had already been dead and gone for a long time. But God took the time to say, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He didn't say, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. He said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In other words, He's not just the God of your very best. You see, He's God and He loves you. He loves you even when you were at your worst. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 8, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for loving me when no one else would. Thank you, Lord, for loving me and loving us when we were at our when we were when no one else, when we were at a place where no one else wanted to tolerate us, where we were at a place in our life and in our walk where no one else could even look at us without hating on us. See, according to Scripture, he does he doesn't love you because you're holy. He doesn't love you because you read your Bible every day. He doesn't love you because you're religious. He doesn't love you because you're always on time for church and you're never late. He doesn't love you because you sit there and you judge everybody with an eye of judgment and because you think that it's your right to go and tell everybody how wrong they are. He doesn't love you because you fast and you pray and you preach and you speak and you teach and you sing. According to the scripture, he loved you while you were lying. He loved you while you were cheating. He loved you while you were stealing. He loved you while you were whoremongering. He loved you when you were at a 
the strip club, whether you were stripping or whether you, you, you were there as a customer. He loved you when you were sleeping around in two hotels. He loved you while you were doing things that you knew that you shouldn't be doing. He loved you while you were getting drunk. He loved you while you were getting high. He loved you when you were locked up in a jail cell or in a prison. He loved you when you were in your perversion, in your filth. He didn't wait until you got better to love you. He loved you back then. That's how much he was. He loved you while you were still in your mess when no one else could love you. And he loves you even now. You see, there's somebody in here, you don't feel so holy this morning. You don't feel so holy right now, but you're standing on holy ground. Not because anybody else is here, but because God is here. You know what I love about God? Moses was a murderer. He was a bandit, and he was on the run. He was an outlaw, and he was on the run. But because God had a plan for his life, God brought him to his lowest common denominator and built him back up as the man of God that he's supposed to be. Moses hid from everybody, and he even hid from God. And God found him. I don't care who you are, you can't hide from God. Amen. Read your Bible and you'll see that the Bible says that if you make your head and make your bed in hell, that God is there. It says that if you go into the uttermost parts of the world, that he is there. You can be locked up in a jail cell, and you can be locked up in a prison, and yet God is there. The power of God can fall in that cell. Some of you in this room know what I'm talking about. The Bible says that you can go to the highest heaven and that God is there. You see, God will find you wherever you're at, even now. And he'll bring you out of that thing because he has a plan for your life. But my question is, are you going to submit and surrender, like the song said, to his plan, to his will? You see, we, there's a song that says God is the God of miracles. Well, I'll, I'll say he's still God, even in your mistakes. There's a song that... Um, popular band, Christian band, they're more of a modern day Christian band that they sing and it's called My Testimony. It's a beautiful song. God bless you, baby. It's a beautiful song and it talks about how God is the God of my testimony. He's the God of my message. But I'll submit to you that he's even the God, he's still God in your mess. Even when you mess up, it doesn't change the fact that he's God. And God took Moses from being a, an outlaw, a murderer, and, and a bandit on the run to being the deliverer and the leader of his people. You see, God has a plan for your life. And you don't have to be extraordinary because you, you, you serve an extraordinary God. Mm. You belong to an extraordinary God. And God can use something that is natural to do the supernatural. He can show his strength in your weakness. Every time that you display a small victory, he's showing his strength in your weakness. He's the God that can make all things possible, even the impossible. He can bless you from absolutely nothing. He's the one who can speak life when there is no life. He's the one who can say, let there be, and all of a sudden there is because he said it. The Bible says that he cannot lie. Moses went as far as to make excuses as to why he was not qualified to be used by God. He actually went as far as to say, hey, there's somebody better. I've got an older brother. His name is Aaron. I have a stirring problem. Lord, you can't use me. And he gave God every excuse in the book. And God didn't accept any of his excuses, and he doesn't accept any of your excuses this morning either. When you belong to God, you can do the impossible because you belong to Jesus. And God is getting ready to do something extraordinary in somebody's life in this place. But my question is, are you willing to do what you're supposed to, to do your part, to repent? Or are you going to allow pride to hold you back? And God's not going to accept your fear. He's not going to accept your doubt. He's not going to accept your insecurity or your shyness. He's not going to accept your shame or your uncertainty. He's not going to accept any of that. He's going to use you in spite of your excuses like the way he did with Moses. But you're going to have to totally surrender to God. You're going to have to be totally vulnerable before God in his presence this morning. You're going to have to get to a place where you humble yourself and you push pride aside in his presence this morning. That's why he told Moses. That's what that whole representation meant when he said, take the saddles off your feet. For the place that you stand is holy ground. He's telling you to remove the obstacles and the things that are in between you and his holy ground. The hindrances, the distractions, all of those things. He's God Almighty and he's showing you who he is. 
He shut the entire world down one time by a flood. And he recently did it again through this pandemic. God has a plan for your life, but it's time to repent this morning. And it's time to change your behavior this morning. You see, someone in here is about to have an encounter with God. Someone in here is about to be set free. Someone in here is about to change your life. But my question to you this morning is, does he have your attention? Because he's been trying to get it this whole time, probably your whole life. God used Moses mightily. As a matter of fact, according to Scripture, there was never a prophet like Moses before or again after Moses. That's how awesome he, he used Moses. What does he want to do with you in these last days? Who am I talking to in here? I know that I feel like I could I could call you out. I know that this message is for somebody who's been holding back, somebody who's been sitting there saying, "When is my time coming?" And I came here to tell you that it is now. But you need to learn what you need to learn, and you need to do what you need to do, so that way you don't have to go through the things that you've gone through again. When I used to work in the jail. Many, many years ago, they would announce something over the PA at the, at the, at the time where there was going to be a, a shift change, where there was going to be a changing of the guard. And all of a sudden, a voice would come out over the PA and, and, and they would say, attention in the building, attention in the building. They were trying to get everybody's attention. The freeze is on. The freeze is now on. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Whether it be by choice or not. <laughs> and I believe that in the time and day that we're living in right now, that God has had to stop some things to say, do I have your attention? Do you see me in this? Do you hear me? Can you hear me now? And my question to you this morning is what do you plan to do about it? Because we can sit and be where we were. We can even go back to being who we were before this. But that's not what God wants for any of us. You know what we learned through this two years? Is that there were things that we were doing that were not necessary. Whether you're a believer or not. And so now we need to take what we learned and we need to do something about it or we will be doomed to repeat it over again. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want to go through this again. I want us to learn what we need to learn and do what we need to do so that we can move forward in the things of the Lord. Sometimes it's, it's just, you know, during this, during this whole thing, I've gotten so close to my family to the point to where I'm thankful because I've never been this close with them. Don't get me wrong, I've lost a lot of people. I lost a lot of people like many of you have. But God is doing something mighty here, and we can't ignore it. And we have to do like the Bible says and live by faith. I don't want to go back to the way it was. I want to come out of this thing better. I want us all to come out of this thing better. I want you, my prayer for you, when I pray for you, is that you accomplish everything that God ordained and decreed for you to accomplish from before the time that you were born. Everything that you've gone through, the good, the bad, the ugly, that God would use it for his glory to bring more souls into the kingdom. You see, it's not even about you. God may be after your children or your grandchildren. You could have the next Billy Graham or the next T.D. Jakes or the next whomever in your lineage, and God is trying to stop that and stun that before they ever get started. How dare he mess with us? How dare he mess with our children? How dare he mess with the lineage after us? It is my job as, as the predecessor of this family to stand up for my, the people that come after me. It is my job as a preacher, as, as a man of God, to stand up for the generations that come after us. Like, devil, you're alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's my job to do that. And if I don't do it, Dacho said something earlier. If I don't do it, no one is going to relieve my post, and it'll end with me. How dare the devil mess with us like that? 
Would you all please stand to your feet? But it's going to take something. It's going to take for us to put our pride aside. I'll be honest with you. I don't care how much scripture you know. The devil knows the Bible. As a matter of fact, he attacked Jesus with scripture. He ain't impressing nobody. I'm not being ugly. That is a cockier area, what I just said. That's the truth. The devil knows scripture. The truth is it. Are you ready to change? Are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to give your life to Christ fully? Even if you're a believer. Because what I've learned is that there are many of us who are believers who will say, well, we'll just go this far. And then the rest you ought to do. The rest is for the holy rollers. The rest is for the Bible thumbers. The rest is for, I, I want God to take me the way that I am, and he does. But then he calls you to change, and he calls you to repent. <clears throat> he calls you to give up some stuff. And to walk humbly. And love mercy. And justice. And walk humbly with your God, is what the scripture says. So this morning, I call you out. And I say this, do what you have to do to make things right with God. Do what you have to do. And this is coming from somebody who's, who, who was in the world so deep at one time that I had to take steps backwards to try to get my life right with God. Not that anybody was coming up to me and saying, hey, that's sin, you're doing it wrong, you're living wrong, you're living a wrong lifestyle, you're doing this and you're doing that. It was nothing like that. It was that there was a holy God who said, you want to be my child, you better give these things up. And I did. So I'm not coming to you as somebody who hasn't done it or hasn't had to do it. I'm going to tell you something. There's a scripture in the Bible where it talks about this man named Joseph. And the Bible says that God had given Joseph a bunch of favor. He had given Joseph so much favor that his brothers were jealous of him. And the Bible says that his brothers, his own brothers, threw him into a pit. And some guy found him, and they took him into slavery, and they sold him to a dude named Potiphar, who was, he was like the, the head guard for Pharaoh. He lived up in Potiphar's house for a little while. And he gained so much favor, because he had got the father's favor. He gained so much favor with, uh, with Potiphar, that Potiphar gave him the keys to the house. He was like, you do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. You got the keys to the house. Potiphar's wife came after Joseph. Did y'all know that? Mm -hmm. And according to Scripture, I'm not being gross or disrespectful. According to Scripture, she was fine. Okay? It doesn't say it like that. It says that she was... That's the modern day version. I'm going to put this on. The scripture says that she was so beautiful... That when she made an advance at Joseph, Joseph said, I can't do what you want me to do. He didn't say, I don't want to do it. He said, I can't. In other words, the temptation was there. The test was there. Yeah. See, let me say it like this. You can make any excuse that you want to. Okay? I'm not being ugly. I'm being real with you. Church people will try to make excuses all the time when we need to stop. And I include myself in that. We need to stop. See, because getting right with God isn't coming to the altar and giving your justifications for why you're still doing what you're doing, why you're still showing your brother or your sister hatred, or why you're still involved in this sin and saying, Lord, well, if you want me, you've got to accept me the way that I am. He already did that. As a matter of fact, he died on the cross, according to Scripture, while you were still a sinner. But now it's time to do your part. And that's the part that's hard for Christians, is for us to do our part. Because we feel, no, 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 this is one-sided. God already died for me. He died for my sins. I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to heaven. That's not what Scripture says. The Scripture says you and I have to repent. And to repent means to turn 180 degrees and run back to the cross. To repent means to turn 180 degrees and run back to the arms of the Father. See, let me say it like this, okay? Let me be real with you. There was a time where God put me into youth ministry. But I allowed being in youth ministry to get to my head. 
And I thought I was somebody in the kingdom. And God humbled me. And God said, baby, you got a lot to learn still. And he sat me down. I almost went through a divorce. I've shared this with you. This is nothing new. And God began to tear and root things out of me and pull things out of me that I had to give up even as a Christian, even as a preacher, even as a pastor. So when I come to you, I'm not coming to you saying things that I like hearing come out of my mouth. I'm coming to you saying, don't let another day pass by with your pride and proud, with your pride and your ego and your religious rhetoric getting away. See, some of you, you've probably been in ministry, and right now you're wondering, Lord, what happened? I want my ministry back. Well, what did you do? You know, let me tell you something. Every time that I get into an argument with my wife, right, I'll call my mom. And I'll say, Mom, man, pray for us because we're, we're going through it right now. And she'll say, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, like, am I lying in here? Right? What did you do? And I'll say, Mom. And she'll say, what? You're my son. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. That's real. There are some parents that, oh, no, me, Lord, me, I can't do any wrong. <laughs> Whatever. You're in denial. Amen? <laughs> and I'm not talking to River. I'm talking to you. You're, you're, you're lying to yourself. And then I'll say, well, this is what I did. Okay, then you do right on your part, and you go make it right. Mm. See, I'm here to tell you with that kind of love, to say, you know what, man, maybe you were doing something wrong. Don't sit there and make justifications and try to justify yourself through the Word of God. We're the worst at that. We'll try to, oh, look, this is what it says right here. We need to keep reading. <laughs> you need to keep reading if you're not getting it. We need to stop that. We're our own worst enemy. We really are. And so today's the day that we come to repentance before a mighty God. And we say, Lord, have your way. I surrender to you right now. I want to open up this altar. And I want to give you some time. Just to be with the Lord. And wherever God leads us, that's what we're going to do. If God leads us to, to, to pray for you, then we're going to pray for you. If, if he doesn't, if he just leads us to allow you to have his moment with you so that he can do what he's going to do, well, then that's what we'll do. But with the time that we have left, I want to invite you to this altar. To do what you have to do. To learn what you have to learn. To get things right. Don't, don't, don't be like the Israelites walking around the same mountain for 40 years. God gave them, graciously mm. gave them 40 years. But that doesn't mean you're going to get 40 years. It doesn't mean that you're going to get that kind of time. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to get things right. Put aside your religious rhetoric. Put aside what you think you know. Because you're not impressing God. I'm not being ugly. Please, please don't take this as, as, as a form of disrespect. I'm, that's not my intent here. My intent is to get us into the place where we need to be, into that new territory, into the promised land. We can't go in carrying some of the stuff that we're carrying. you got to let that stuff die. That's why Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, the religious people of his time, because they were so caught up in the tradition, and they were so caught up in the religion, they were so caught up in the traditions of man that they lost sight while Jesus Christ was standing right in front of them. Don't be that kind of person. Be the kind of person that when Jesus walks in, you know his voice. And you say, that's Jesus. There's no mistake about it. Because we're coming into some times that are real crazy where people are going to start making some type of proclamations of that they're the Messiah and they're lying. And you and I have to be right with God so that we know the counterfeit. Because if, you, if you're not, you won't know and you'll be deceived. The Bible says that even the, the elite were deceived. In the last days. Those are the people who thought they had it going on. Those are the people who thought they were righteous. Those were the people who thought they were religious. The truth is, is you got to be like David. And you got to be like Moses and say, Lord, that I may know you more. That's my prayer every day. Lord, I want to know you more. It's not about standing up here preaching his word to you. It's about knowing him more. And in doing so, he allows me the opportunity and the honor to be able to speak and preach and teach his word. That's why I believe that he put me back in ministry. Is because I captured something and I realized it's not you. 
It's Him. And He gets the glory. He gets the honor every day. Mm. Don't get too big for your britches, baby boy, or I'll sit you down with you. That's the truth. Yeah. I don't want to go through what I've gone through already. Because some of the stuff I've gone through, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. So this morning, with the time that we have left, I want to invite you to this altar and allow God to break the things that he needs to break. Let me tell you something about breaking. It's painful. There are some things that I've had to give up that I didn't want to give up. And it hurt, and I cried, and I complained, and I did it all to God. And he was like, if you want what I have next for you, this is the route you'll go. And now I've learned. And now I want to share this with you and say, if God is telling you to give up something, you need to do it. Because he has something in store for you. And you'll never get it until you release your hands of what's filling it. Until you release your time of what's occupying it. Otherwise, you'll stay right where you're at. And I don't want that for any of us. I don't want us to go back to normal. I want us to, uh, to have a new normal. You know what kind of normal I want us to have? I want us to have the kind of normal that the Bible speaks about. That when people pass by here, the shadow of this place brings healing and restoration. I want the kind of healing that when somebody walks in here, they say, you know what, I don't know what it is, but there's something about this church, and I need whatever is in there, and his name is Jesus, and he's the Holy Spirit. You know what I want out of this thing? I want us to come together and be able to lay hands on the dead and for them to rise again for real in the name of Jesus. I want us to be able to pray for the sick and for them to be healed. I want us to pray for people who are going through a divorce and God show up and save that matrimony. I want God to show up and save people in this church. I want people like you to go to your friends and family and say, hey, listen, I don't care how you worship, but you need to come to this church because God is there. That's what I want. Not Pastor George, or not Pastor Johnny, not Pastor Thatcher, or not Pastor O. I want you to tell people God is in that place. And when you show up, things happen. I want us to come into a service like this and devils and demons to run and scream like the cowards that they are. Because they can't stand the holy presence of God in this place. That's what I want. Amen? I want us to be able to pray for a country thousands of miles away and for things to stop happening just like that. It's happening. It's ha Bombs are not going off over there. That's pretty awesome. Because the same God that we're praying to, He can do miracles thousands of miles away.
Because of your boldness and your courage to say, you know what, I, I need you. I need you. Remember what I said earlier. Just saying a prayer doesn't save you. Transferring your trust, repenting. That's what changes you. Can I be real with you? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I'll even go as far as to say, I don't even think tears change you. Because this isn't an emotionally led thing. This is a, this is a conscious decision. See, God doesn't love you just when He feels like it. He has a love for you. It's called an agape love. It means that He will love you no matter what. He chooses to love you. And this morning, I want to invite you to make a choice and a conscious decision, a conscious commitment to surrender your life to Christ. And to say, I'll love you. And I'll, I'll walk with you and I'll follow you. Even when I don't feel like it. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that on the third day God raised Him from the dead, the Bible promises that you shall be saved. It says that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved or you may be saved or you could be saved or there's a slight chance or a possibility. It says you shall. That means it has to be done. So this morning, I want to invite you to, to confess it with your own mouth and believe it in your own heart. However God puts it in your heart. Every time that I come up here and I pray the prayer, it's to give you an outline or an example. But you say it, how God puts it in your heart. The important thing is that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that on the third day God raised you from the dead. Those are the requisites. And then I invite you to surrender and to repent and to return to the arms of the Savior. Everyone in this room with your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you say, Heavenly Father? Heavenly Father. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And today, today, I repent. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Come into my life. Wash me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. Make me. Make me. Into who you created me to be. Into who you created me to be. From this day forward. From this day forward. I will follow you. I will follow you. With everything that I am. With everything that I am. And everything that I got. And everything that I got. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. For forgiving me. Forgiving me. Of my sins. Of my sins. I now call you. I now call you. And confess you. I confess you. As my Lord. As my Lord. As my Savior. As my Savior. And as my Master. And as my Master. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For your gift. For your gift. Of your Son. Of your Son. His death on the cross. And his death on the cross. And thank you. And thank you. For resurrecting him. For resurrecting him. Thank you for your gift of salvation and eternal life. Thank you for your gift of salvation and eternal life. I belong to you. I belong to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God the glory? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I know it may not look like it, but I feel like going and running a few miles. Like I'm pumped up. But we'll go even on Tuesday. Boom. Just kidding. But everyone, please stand to your feet. We're going to pray to be this. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, the undefeatable name, the unmatchable name, the invincible name. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that church would begin as we walk out these doors. I pray, Father God, that this word would stir something new in our hearts. And there are those of us here in this room who maybe still haven't repented. I pray that you would call us to repentance and that we would completely repent. Of anything that is not of you. Father, you would take us into the next level. Father, I don't want to repeat some of the things that we've, that we've had to go through. Lord, bring salvation into the house. Bring salvation into our families. Bring salvation into our lineage. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that we would walk, as we walk out of here, yes, let church begin, but let us not go anywhere outside of your presence. Please be with us everywhere we go, and let us show people what Jesus Christ lives on. Now, may the Lord bless you, and may he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he turn his countenance towards you, and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Journey to the Cross Church, I love you. Next week, we got another call from Brooklyn. Please bring your family. God bless you. Have a nice day.